morning everyone at this recording time that we're having here uh, it marks a week of a point in the year that we finish up vacations you know the fall season comes everybody's back in school uh, you've gone through your vacation period you're trying to get readjusted to your schedule to go back to work but those were normal times we're not in normal times today. So we just kind of have to adapt to what's new to us and what we have to, we have to defeat the challenges that are ahead of us in trying to schedule and work out a vacation. So as you know, I'm on vacation. Uh, it's interesting how we set up to go to vacation or go on a vacation. Some of us prepare quite a bit, uh, do a lot of planning uh, of our vacation. Some people like to go to the same places each year. Some people like to pack up and head out for the weekend. And some people spend hours, even weeks, obsessing over the perfect trip. But we all share one thing in common. When we come home from vacation, we're worn out most of the time. Now, for a lot of us, that was back when we had kids and we went to places and did things we didn't do normally. And it affected us. We got tired, we came home and said, I and would always say, I need a vacation from my vacation. Of course, a few of us can't plan normal vacations. There's those who have this thing in them that says i want to go somewhere special and i want to do something special it's fascinating there's a travel company called black tomato it's a travel agency that offers a very special kind of vacation package now i looked it up on the internet and black tomato send you to some of the most exotic places that you could see you know uh remote places places that take a lot of planning and the black tomato planning this for you is not cheap but they do another they do a special thing in their in their advertising is that they say that they can send you to a destination that is challenging. Now, there are some people that like a challenge. It might be a place where there's a challenging environment, like a remote wilderness or a desert or a volcano or mountains. But once you get to the airport, you receive the essential information about your trip. You, you receive a satellite telephone and survival gear for your destination. Then after your surprise excursion, it's up to you to make it back to safety and civilization. Now, that's a little too challenging for me, but it sounds like an episode on TV like Survivor or something like that. But there's, there's no cameras following you around. However, the company website offers this assurance. Your journey will be closely tracked by Black Tomatoes' experienced expedition operation teams as a safety net. You won't see them, but they'll always be able to see you. Well, thank the Lord for that. That makes me feel much better but i still wouldn't go on it it takes a certain kind of amount of courage to take a trip to a surprise destination that requires survival gear most of us like to have a little more control when it comes to our travel plans like me a condo on the beach and great restaurants not much of a challenge once you understand a little background about what we're going to speak of in the Bible passage today. You may question if Jesus was not in one of these 
black tomato get lost destination things. You see, our passage begins with him leaving a place. That place was up around Galilee. And he was trying to teach the disciples about uh, what makes a person uh, defiled, sin. You know, he was trying to tell them it's not what you take in because they're wanting to say you can't eat this, you can't eat that. And that was what defiles a person. And he says, no, it's not what defiles a person. It's what's in the heart. What's come out of your mouth instead of what goes into your mouth. Disciples wouldn't get it, couldn't get it. They ask again at the end of him talking to the crowd, what did you mean by that? And he just said, hey, can't you all get this? If you look in, in chapter 15, verse uh, 21, you'll see uh, that Jesus, after this, he says, okay, I'm going away. Let's go. Where does he go? Well, takes a trip. He went to Tyre and Sidon, which were Gentile towns about 50 miles away from where Jesus had last been in Galilee. Why did Jesus travel 50 miles to the Gentile territory? Did he have some urgent business there? Did he sign up for a get lost tour from Black Tomato? The answer to both questions is no. There is no explanation in the Bible provided as to why Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon, but he did. So let's continue the story. When he gets there, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is a demon possessed and suffering terribly. This event may have been one of the strangest things the disciples up to this time in Jesus' ministry had witnessed. You don't imagine that Jesus came 50 miles from home just to minister to this distraught mother, do you? Who knows? After all, this is Jesus. Nobody cares about people who are hurting like Jesus. It makes no difference their religion or where they live. It is interesting to note that after his encounter with the Canaanite woman, Jesus turns around and heads back to his usual area of ministry around the Sea of Galilee. So it would appear that the only obvious reason Jesus might have traveled to this challenging destination was to minister to this desperate woman. And this was not just any woman. This was a Canaanite woman. In Jesus' day, Jew would speak with, Jew wouldn't speak with a woman outside his family, and particularly not a Canaanite. They were traditionally considered enemies of the Jewish people. And it's true. At first, Jesus seems to spurn her cries for help. Matthew tells us that after she made this desperate request of him, Jesus did not answer a word. That surely was not encouraging to the woman. His disciples were no help either. They came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. She's really making a fuss. Tell her to go away. At this, Jesus answered, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Perhaps he looked at his this looked at his disciples with a look of how was that this woman was not crushed at jesus response however she didn't give up she came and knelt before him and said lord help me and he replied with another crushing remark it's not right to take children's bread and toss it to the dogs he just called her a dog Jesus is setting the disciples up for a teachable moment, but he also is testing the woman. Yes, it is, Lord, the Canaanite woman said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now, scholars puzzle over Jesus' conversation with this woman. It seems so 
unlike or unchrist like but I wonder if Jesus wasn't giving this woman a test of her desire to have her daughter healed. But even more important, a test of her faith that he really could heal her daughter. And how do we know that? Because the way Jesus ends this unusual story, he commends this woman for her great faith. There are only three people in the Bible who are specifically commended by Jesus for their great faith. A Roman officer who pleaded with Jesus to heal his servant. A woman who had been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years and touched the border of Jesus' robe in hopes of receiving healing. And this Canaanite woman who came to Jesus begging him to heal her demon-possessed daughter funny thing is that none of these three people had the right according to Jewish law to approach Jesus with a request for help they were separated from him by a huge wall of cultural and religious norms we've already mentioned that the Canaanite woman of the Canaanite woman's lowly status but the woman hemorrhaging blood was ritually unclean due to her bleeding and shouldn't have been having touched Jesus' border of his robe at all. As for the Roman officer, he was a representative of a Gentile government which oppressed the Jewish people. By the law, none of these three people had the right to bring their desperation to Jesus. But Jesus didn't reject them or correct them. In fact, he commended each one of them for their great faith. I don't know about you, but Jesus' definition of great faith looks different than mine. I usually equate great faith with courage and self-discipline and or sacrifice. Superhero saints, not desperate people pushing their way into Jesus' presence. Desperation is a scary state of being. Desperation can drive us to make unthinkable, bad decisions. Really bad choices in life. Many of us know what it's like to be, feel desperate. Just like the Roman officer and the bleeding woman and the mother with the demon-possessed child, the agony threatens to overwhelm them. And it overwhelms us. We feel like we can't breathe. There's a, a popular phrase, desperate times call for what? That's right, desperate measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Perhaps a more helpful phrase would be desperate times call for Jesus. That's the real truth of the matter. In Australia in 2007, an episode of a television series called May Day. And you imagine this is like you're out in the ocean and you're calling in May Day, May Day, we're sinking. Desperate times. But this particular program was interrupted by a frightening technical glitch. For six minutes on that show, a haunting audio loop played in the background. It was the sound of a voice repeating over and over for six minutes. And the voice said, Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. For six minutes, it said that over and over. Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. An investigation to discover what that or about that audio loop was from a news program the and they, they found out that it was from a news program the previous year about an insurgent soldiers firing on civilians in a foreign country. In such a setting, such a prayer would certainly be appropriate. Jesus Christ help us all. Lord, 
However, the investigation did not reveal how an audio loop of that desperate prayer happened to interrupt a national broadcast for six minutes a year later. The Bible passage about the Canaanite woman shows us that desperation doesn't qualify you for having great faith. Neither does your gender or social status. All that's required is the willingness to bring your desperate need to Jesus. It's interesting. This woman wasn't from the Jewish faith, and she addressed Jesus as Lord. The word she used refers to one who is supreme, a master. How did she know? Even when Jesus' own disciples weren't sure of his claims, this foreigner recognized who he was. She knew that the power of life was in his hands, and somehow she knew he was her only hope. How many times have we tried to take matters into our own hands, only to find the situation is not within our control? Anne Lamott, a New York Times bestselling author, has said that her prayer every morning is, help me, help me, help me. Her nightly prayer is, thank you, thank you, thank you. In between those two prayers, she says, is an occasional wow prayer when she sudden, is suddenly aware of God's work in her life, in her daily life. The Canaanite mother and Anne Lamott could understand each other's prayer life. Help me, help me, help me. That's a legitimate prayer. Sometimes it's the only prayer that we can manage. And notice that the Canaanite woman brought her desperation to Jesus, even when he initially responded with silence and then seemed to turn away. Some people read this passage and think Jesus was being insensitive to this mother's pain. But remember, it may be that Jesus did come on foot to this faraway Gentile town, 50 miles from his home, just to meet this one desperate woman in need. Even more impressive, he came from the right hand of God to this lonely planet to help us all in our times of desperation. Desperate times call for Jesus. In 2015, Kate Boyer was diagnosed in stage four cancer in her abdomen. She was a divinity professor at Duke University and the mother of a one-year-old son. Kate and her husband was devastated by her diagnosis. In Guide Post magazine, Kate writes of how she always thought she had a deal with God, a quid pro quo, if you will. That's a phrase that's been banded around quite about for the last three years. It means a favor or advantage granted or expected in return for something. Quid pro quo. Kate secretly felt she had a quid pro quo. And she had it with God. She grew up as a good Christian girl, working hard, keeping all the rules. She married a good Christian man, got a doctorate in religious studies, served in her church. And deep in her heart, Kate had thought that God might reward her for her faithfulness by giving her a manageable life. Dying young from a painful and invasive cancer didn't fit into this deal she thought she had with God. She writes, I had been hoping for control. Work hard, stay right with God, and life will work out. The key word here is that little word, and. 
do this and you get that. Action, result, guaranteed. That's control. Ever since my diagnosis, she writes, I've been praying hard. But Jesus, I had to admit, never says that God offers us certainty. Jesus says God offers us love. Could I love God even knowing I could die in month, two months? Kate wrote about this tough question in Guidepost in 2018. She stated, that's a tough question, isn't it? Jesus never says that God offers us certainty. Jesus says God offers us love. Jesus is absolute proof that God is love. It's proof that God loves us. Jesus may have walked a hundred miles round trip to Tyre and Sidon to minister to this Canaanite woman. And Jesus walked in her shoes all the way to the cross for no other reason than that he loves us. He shared our weakness, our questions, our pain. Remember that the night before his arrest, Jesus prayed so desperately that he sweated blood drops. He sweated drops of blood. Jesus understands what it is to be desperate. He didn't come to wave a magic wand, take away our troubles. But he did come to show us that we're not alone. His message and his ministry kept coming back to this one truth. There is a God, and God loves you. Desperate times call for Jesus. What was the Canaanite mother's first request of Jesus? Have mercy on me. She knew that mercy is an essential part of God's character. And so even though she knew that she had no right to approach Jesus, she was counting on his mercy to meet her daughter's needs. And notice that when e even when Jesus was silent, even when he tried to turn her away, she knelt down at his feet. The Greek word used here indicates that she knelt down in worship before him. No matter whether he answered her for help or not, she would still worship him because he is Lord and because she could count on his mercy. Dr. Keith Brantley served as a medical missionary and lived in Liberia, West Africa in 2014. An epidemic of Ebola virus swept through Liberia. Over the course of 21 months, more than 11,000 people died from the virus. No one was safe. Healthy people died within days of being infected. So imagine Dr. Brantley's fear when he began manifesting symptoms of the disease. He put himself in on immediate quarantine. His colleagues couldn't come near him. His family was back in the U.S. He had to deal with his illness and his fears all alone. Can you imagine we're experiencing that again with, with the COVID? That people go into the hospital and they leave their families and they're all alone except for the people that are attending to them. They, our technology allows us to speak to each other on phones or Zoom or other outlets but it's not like having your loved one there holding your hand and telling you that it'll be all right. So Bentley, Brantley put, picked up his Bible and took his desperation to the Lord. And Brantley found comfort in a passage from Hebrews 4.16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This verse become, became his focus for prayer over the next few days as his pain and nausea increased. When tests confirmed that Brantley had co contracted Ebola, he called his wife Amber in Texas to give her news. 
Amber Brantley reports that her fear and sadness were so great that she had trouble finding words to pray. So instead, she simply sang hymns of trust, praising God in spite of her situation. The Brantleys took their need to Jesus in different ways, each one trusting in God's mercy and love no matter what his answer was to their prayers. Brantley's colleagues arranged to have him flown to Atlanta for an experimental treatment for Ebola. Within a few days, his condition began to improve, and God mercifully answered the Brantley's prayers when a short time later, he walked out of the Atlanta hospital as a survivor of the Ebola virus. Of course, not everyone who trusts in Jesus and suffers a serious disease walks out of the hospital cured. If they do not walk out of the hospital cured, however, that does not mean their prayers were in vain. If they do not walk out of the hospital cured, they walk into the arms of Jesus with a new perfect body made whole at last. Jesus complimented the Can this Canaanite woman for her great faith. Great faith is pretty simple, at least by Jesus' standards. Bring your desperation to him and trust him in God's love for you. The God who gave up his power and majesty and ultimately his life to save us from the power of death loves you too much to ever turn you away. Desperate times don't always call for desperate measures, but desperate times always call for Jesus. God loves you. He always has, and he always will. Don't ever forget that when desperate times come your way. And all God's people said, Amen.